Welcome everyone to another edition of Unravel Your Mind. We're here to transform relationships to love and life. I have so many updates. I have so many questions. Uh, I have so many insights and answers to share. So I'm excited you're here. If you're listening live, please type any question in the chat, anything to do with transforming your relationships to love and life. And if you're watching on replay, you can still type it in the chat and I'll answer them next week. So welcome, welcome, welcome to Unravel Your Mind. I wanted to do a little update because I spent yesterday with Reese Witherspoon and I have to admit to you that I am not a big Hollywood fan. And I wasn't necessarily even a huge Reese Witherspoon fan other than I love her on the morning show. But after spending the day with her yesterday, I, I just absolutely adore this woman for many, many reasons. And one of them is what she's doing with her company, Hello Sunshine. So if you haven't heard of it, it's a, it's a mega media company. And if you haven't heard of her book club, Reese's book club, um, there are two major ways that she is helping to support women get their stories uh, out there in the world. So it was an amazing day. I got lots of, lots of props. I got a little journal. You can't really see it, but it says, hello, sunshine. And the whole event was called shine away. So it was super, super fun filled with thousands of people um, that all had, I think, a very similar intention to really bring their stories forward, to bring their light, their love to humanity. So um, it was wonderful. And I think, you know, the other thing that I want to say about Reese is that you see an actress, you know, acting right on, on the big screen and, and you know that they're acting. And so you're never really quite sure exactly how they are live and in person. And, you know, speaking to large groups of people, I'm sure is no problem for Reese, but it's not necessarily her job, right? That's not what she does every day. So when I heard her speak and when I heard her really share how she feels, it made an, it made an impact on me and it, and it really shifted me to understand like where her heart really lies in this. So she had an incredible panel actually of people. She had um, right up front, she had uh, Jennifer, um, uh, Jennifer Garner and I'm trying to see, I feel terrible. I don't know this other person very well either. See, that's now you know that I really don't, uh, I really don't know Hollywood. And Mindy Kaling, I'm, I know she's super famous. I just don't know her um, beyond meeting her yesterday. And they had an amazing session where they all talked about um, shining away your light, right? Shining away your love, just shine away, like really step into who you are, what you're here to do. And so I so appreciate what all of them are doing. And there was just a whole beautiful agenda, um, lots of good stuff, lots of influencers, lots of people that I'm going to start following. Like as much as I put stuff out on social media, um, I found some people that I want to actually follow because I don't really follow a lot of people. Um, so I will, uh, I can put their information in the show notes too. Just to, if you're interested, let me know and then I'll do that. Um, all right. So let's get started with the show because so many questions today and they're good ones. They're always so juicy and they're always so genuine and real. So let's get into this. Um, do you think your passion and purpose are always aligned? Do they need to be? And I think this is a great question because there's kind of different ways I'm going to, I'm going to answer it. Um, I think that whenever you're passionate about something, it doesn't have to become like your whole purpose in life, right? Like I might be passionate about painting, but it doesn't mean that I have to be a painter. So that's not necessarily always linked, but your purpose, if you're living your purpose, you have to be passionate about it, right? Otherwise, it's not really in the flow of your purpose. And that's how you know. Because when you're living your purpose, no matter what comes your way, the stumbles, the pitfalls, the, the naysayers, you just keep persevering because you are so passionate about this. So for me, being an awakening agent, sort of disguised as an author, entrepreneur, and an advisor, I know I'm here to help the planet awaken. I know that I'm here simply to heal myself back to the wholeness, to remember myself in oneness with everyone and everything so that I can raise my vibration, so that I can shine my light brightly. And so I do that with deep passion, even at times when things don't make sense. Because, And I don't mean that they don't make sense, but I mean they don't make sense to everybody else, right? It's like you feel like the unicorn, you know, 
keeping going on your, on your passion and your purpose, because they're so joined and so together. So yes, if you're living your purpose, you better be passionate about it, but you don't have to always make all of your passions, um, your purpose in life. So, but when they're combined together, it's a super powerful thing. So I would love to hear what your passion and purpose is in life. And if you feel like yours are aligned and if not, maybe there's a place for you to really dig into there and see, hmm, maybe something that is a real passion of mine needs to be my purpose. Maybe I'm not living my purpose. Maybe I don't know what my purpose is yet. And sometimes when we dig or dig deeper into our passions, we realize, huh, there's a way that I can really do this as my purpose. So just a little nudge there from spirit to, to say, dig into that. And are we all on purpose? Because when we're on purpose, we shine away out into the world, right? So um, that was a great reminder also from yesterday. Okay, next question. I've had waves of emotion that could be classified as depression. At times, I don't know how to get out of them and wait for them to pass. Is there any advice to move through them more quickly? Well, sometimes quickly um, is not the goal. Sometimes feeling the emotion is. So I really feel it's important when you feel those waves, and I know exactly what you're talking about. I get them as well. I think there's so much happening right now with humanity and the underbelly coming up and all of our, our thought constructs and the societal thought constructs that are surrounding us. So I think we need to feel the emotions, feel them. But then there's a place and a time when we need to stop wallowing in them, right? We talk about this, I feel like almost every episode that there's an element of this because it's mind monitoring. It's mind, I don't even like the word controlling. It's mind monitoring so that you know, hey, I am listening to my mind and it is taking me down a rabbit hole. Or you say, no, I'm listening to my heart. I'm grounded. And to get grounded, that means journaling. That means meditation. That means yoga. That means like inside body activities. That doesn't mean let's go out there and, and do more and, and be in a social circle. I mean, you can, but it's, that's not, that's not what it means when you want to be into reflective and feel your feelings going out and doing something else is just a distractor. So we don't want to pile on. We want to get to the core emotion, feel it, release it, understand it, and then let it go. Right. That is the key to let it go. And that's the mind monitoring that we're all asked to do, especially now, so that when we get to that rabbit hole, we have a choice whether we're going to jump in it and go down the spiral or whether we're going to stay out of it and just look at it from a higher state of consciousness, a higher level of vibration. Oh, there's the trigger. Oh, that's how that's why I'm feeling this way. Let's shift that. Right. So you're at the core of what the issue is, not trying to cover it up. Really, really important distinction. Okay, next question. And if there's anything more that this uh, person would like to know on that, please put it in the chat and I'm happy to answer it. Okay, question number three. I feel guilty spending money for luxury for myself, such as haircut, nails, taxi, etc. I am more generous, generous, especially uh, with money for education and fitness and experiences. But there are certain things which are, are also nice, and often I feel hesitant to go for those options. I want to be more kind to myself, but don't know how. Do you have any thoughts? Yes, I have thoughts on that. I think, you know, this person sounds very conscientious about money, and so I think that that's a good thing. I think that we should not overspend if we don't have the money. Don't spend it. But I also know that there's a consciousness that follows our, our real frugalness, right? Because sometimes I can be super frugal. And I know that that energy has helped me to sustain myself through really tough times of finances and being an entrepreneur. But then there's times when, you know, splurging on those things, as long as I have the money and I'm not putting myself in further debt, spending the money on those things is helpful. It's helpful to abundance. It's helpful to gratitude. It's helpful to self-care. It's helpful. So, you know, having your nails done, hey, if you're really going to, you know, be deciding between a meal and you're having your nails done, well, choose the meal, right? Because your body needs the meal more than it needs the nails. But if you have the money, and it's just feeling like, oh, but I just don't want to run out of money, or I, I just am not sure if it's the right spend of my money, then maybe there's an opportunity to just say, you know what, I'm going to do my own spa day and make doing your own nails 
a self love, a self care time, right? It's not like, oh, I have to do my own nails because I don't want to pay for it at a salon. Like maybe even, I know this might sound crazy, but maybe you get a friend and you say, hey, do you want to do like a mutual spa day? And, and you both are doing it together. And there's nothing wrong with, with giving each other a little foot reflexology or a little foot massage. Or maybe you go down to the beach or you go to the park and you find a rock and you do your own little foot reflexology, right? So it can be lots of different things that you can still have a very similar experience. I certainly recognize having someone else do your nails is, is a, a bit more of a luxury experience. And so I am by no means saying don't do that. I'm just saying that if you're really vacillating between food and nails, of course, choose food, but don't deprive yourself of like these small little things because sometimes the small little things can just make a difference. The other thing I'll add, and I know I'm focusing on the nails, but it's just an example. You can intersperse it with anything, whether it's a taxi or whatever. But when you're having your nails done, when you choose to get into the taxi and pay the extra money, when you probably could walk, but it's extra time, just have fun doing it, right? Connect to the, to the therapist that's working on your nails. Connect to the taxi driver. I mean, in appropriate ways, right? Smile. Give them that warm feeling, not inappropriately, but in a way of like, I see you, I see you, I see your heart, I see your light, even if they're grumpy, right? Like just be you, be your shining bright white light. And that takes the experience like beyond maybe the word luxury and into that category of like raising your oxytocin levels, raising the other person's oxytocin levels and, and just having real fun doing the luxury item um, and staying in that pure gratefulness and the train agrees. I don't know if you can hear it in the background, but it's a uh, definitely says, yes, it's honking its horn. Go do the spa. Um, it's good for us. It's good for us to also be touched by others, not in a taxi, <laughs> but in a, in a foot uh, pedicure that that's definitely something that can be really helpful or just going to get a massage, you know, especially as single ladies. Sometimes we just need that oxytocin and, and, you know, we need it from someone else. We just need, you know, that caring, loving touch. We are, we are feminine. We are in that energy where we're touch and being in our heart and, you know, being in our body is so important. So don't deprive yourself of it. Um, when you can, when you can actually afford it. And if you can't, again, there's other options. You can ask a friend like, Hey, can we exchange? And maybe it's just like back massages, right? Maybe it's just like, Hey, can we spend time together? And, and, um, yeah, who knows? Maybe you get a YouTube video. That's all about how to, you know, give the best back massage ever. And you make it fun. Um, and you do it with each other, right? So there's so many options to this. We don't have to focus in on the money part of it. We can focus in on how we feel about it, part of it, and whatever activity it is that we're questioning. All right. Hopefully that's also helpful. If not, um, give me a little insight in the chat and I'm happy to elaborate. Okay. On to the next question. What do you think about couples who break apart and get back together over and over? Is it a waste of time? Great question. And uh, probably this person that asked the question knows that I am a, a, a big hearted person for going back into relationships. And so there's a couple of ways to look at this. Um, if you're going back and nothing is changing and you're just going back for the sexual intimacy, um, for the security of that feeling or for that hit or that, you know, that, that, that love drug, if you will, um, it's probably not very productive because the, the pulling apart, especially for women or, or individuals more in their feminine, they're not able to just close their heart down and just be like, okay, that was just a thing. Um, and so I don't think it's a good thing to keep going back unless both people are doing their work, right? So sometimes the most profound insights can come, the most profound healings can happen, the most profound shifts can happen when we realize that our beloved is no longer with us. And if we go deeply within ourselves, I know a lot of times we want to focus on like what's wrong with them. But if we really look into ourselves and say, hey, what is it about myself that I'm asking this person to reflect to me? And if you take that and you dig into it, and you go, oh, I get that. I get that part of it. I get, I get how I'm contributing to whatever the issue is in the relationship. Then I think it's fine to go back because then you're just sort of 
I don't really like the word testing, but you are kind of testing yourself. You're like, let me see if I can go back in and not be triggered knowing that this person touches this wound or, you know, is not aligned with me in this particular area and see how you can do. But again, if you're just going back for the romance and the the love drug, then nah, it's probably not the best thing for you. So um, I always like to go back in. And I find that, you know, when I'm with really heart centered partners, the work is incredible that happens during those times. And sometimes it takes a long time. It's not always, you know, like you break up with someone for a week and then you come back together and everything's fine. No, sometimes it's months. Sometimes it's, you know, it can be years. Um, but in cases like if you've read my book, Angels, Herpes and Psychedelics, in cases like Sleeping with the Devil chapter, um, that individual you would not want to keep going back to, even though I did. And any of you who read it, you were like, no, no, don't go back. Don't go back. Um, but those were still lessons that I needed to learn. And, you know, for whatever reason, I had called in the devil to do it. And, and there were so many juicy things that came of that, not things that I would like to repeat and not things that I, that I would want to be re, uh, reinitiated into, if you will. Um, I think I learned my lessons there and I think it made me a stronger person uh, moving forward. But yeah, so you really want to know, like, where is the other person's heart? Is their heart in it? And it's just, it's just an issue of something that they're also healing because we come together based on our wounds, Right. And the sweet spot is when we get to that place of self-love and remembrance, our connection to source, that we can move into relationships with others who are in that same space as divine complements, right? Where we're energetically um, navigating on this earth plane on a similar vibration. And sometimes there is a disparity between the two. And sometimes we need to honor that disparity because sometimes that person's not going to come to your to your exact vibration level. And I don't believe that they need to. It's helpful if you're closer in, in your vibration level. Absolutely. Because then one person isn't pulling the other person along. So lots of uh, lots of ways that we could dissect that particular question. But I think um, it depends upon the details of you depends upon the details of your partner and if you're in your head or you're in your heart. All right, let's go on to the next question. I know I feel like I am aware of and have overcome my childhood wounds. I still find them flaring up and holding me back. Disappointment and love and disappointment slash interesting and business and business relationships. Mm. Um, how can I overcome this once and for all? All right. I think there was a little, a little glitch there, but I get the point of the question. And the question is, you know, about childhood wounds. And I think first and foremost, just love your inner child and accept the wounds that you have. I think we spend a lot of time trying to heal these wounds and there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. But it's always about the remembrance of our perfection and our wholeness. And the childhood wounds are only there for that, that duality experience that we called in in this lifetime for our growth. And that child always, that inner child in all of us, always just wants to be seen, heard, and loved. It is so simple. And so if we weren't seen heard and loved as a child for whatever reason, family issues, friends, whatever it is in those early formative stages of our life, up until about seven years old, our whole life is going to be playing out aspects of all of those childhood wounds, right? Until we get all the lessons. So we're, we're going to keep bringing them back in. And I say, love those wounds love that inner child, love, you know, just really love your inner child and everything that you feel is coming through from childhood, right? Because that is the journey. And that's like, I kind of look back at this and I say, all right, you're in heaven. Like you're in oneness, you're in wholeness, you're part of source. You're up there, just a glowing ball of light, right? The movie, um, I think it's called soul. Uh, I think it's on the Disney channel, maybe. Um, the jazz musician guy, it's such a great, I, they do such a great job of like explaining in a, in a nice cartoony way. So you're part of everything. You're part of source. You're part of God. 
and you're like ready to come down on planet earth and you're like waiting, waiting, waiting. You're like, I want to come in. I want to come in. You choose your parents. You choose the timing. You, you choose every aspect about coming down here to planet earth. And it's like you jump through the, you know, through the veil, through the hole, through whatever you want to call it. And you, you boom, you're here. You're here as a, as a fetus, you're growing in your mom and then you're, you know, popping out and you're here, you're here on the planet and you're like, probably thinking, what the heck did I just do? Um, and then our remembrance, it's like that veil comes over our head, right? And we don't remember that we're still connected to source, but we have our angel guides. We have so many spirits and entities and all, everything is here to support us, everything. But as we come into the world and we grow up with our parents and we learn all of their ideas about life, we start to build our external environment around these beliefs that shape us, right? So as a child, we called in the parents that did the crazy things to us, in some cases intentional, hopefully not intentional, um, but they're just playing out their programs, right? So we're just playing out the programs that we ask them to install in us when we chose to come into this lifetime. It's a real important thing to understand this because if you don't, you think you're a victim and it's so important that you know that everything is happening for you. It's not that everything is happening to you. It feels like it's happening to us when it's happening. That's when you ask the deeper question, why did I call this in? Show me, help me surrender into it. So surrender into the inner child, surrender into all of the things that are showing up now, even as an adult, even though you've done all the work, right? You feel like you've done everything. It's like still just going back to that little girl, that little boy in you and loving yourself, loving every aspect of it, loving the woundedness. You know, if you, if you have a child and they came in and they scraped their knee, you would just be so empathetic to them about, about their, their, their knee, right? Their, their bleeding knee. So we have to look at our inner child that same way. We have to want to go over to our inner child and just be like, oh, honey, like, gosh, you know, we're in this again. All right, let's, let's, let's figure out how to fix that knee. You know, let's, let's, let's just remember ourselves back to wholeness, right? I say fix it. And actually, as I said, it spirit was like, well, it's a little bit different. Um, because you are not really fixing it, right? It's like you're putting a band-aid, you're loving it, you're putting ointment, you know, you're doing, you're part of the process, but you're letting the body heal because the body knows what to do, right? So you're part of source. We're always part of source. That's the deal. Like our bodies wouldn't heal, our hearts wouldn't beat, our eyes wouldn't blink on their own if we weren't connected to this source, this energy, this, this, yes, the beauty of everything that we all are and that we are all connected to. So, all right, I got a little bit far off on that, but the inner child is so important. Please just pay attention to him or her and, and love her or him. And yeah, everything will start to uncoil. It's already uncoiling. You've already uncovered so much, but go into the next thing. Not like I have to heal this. Just, you know, love, 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 love. All right. Um, next question is, Oh, okay. When you answer questions, you seem to just flow with a response. Do you prepare your answers to pre-submitted questions? Actually, this is a great question. I don't prepare anything. Um, when I get pre-submitted questions, I, I put them in my list of questions and spirit immediately. And when I say spirit for me, in this particular case, I'm referring to my higher self. I would say the wisdom that lies within each one of us um, for me, I've spent a lot of time really getting in touch with my, my higher self, my higher states of consciousness, my ability to look at life from, from a different view, like more of a God's eye view and to, to look at the programs and to look at the, the matrix of it, right. To look at, wait, how, how are we, how are we getting this all so muddled up when everything is love? Right. And, and so I just have this way of um, when I get the question, it starts coming, it starts coming, the response. But I, I just say, thank you. Uh, keep it for the show. Thank you. We'll talk about it on the show. 
um, because I don't want to write anything down. There's nothing I remember. There's nothing that I plan to say about any question that anybody asks. Um, I just, I just speak from the depths of my heart and from my soul and from my higher self. And so that's really the, the journey for all of us is to just keep taking the layers off so that we can get to that, that connection. And, and as you know, I've talked about it so many times, just, it's like the North star, right? It's the North star of oneness and shining our light brightly and really being in our own embodiment of that oneness so that we can then share it with others. And so I just utilize that. I just really ask for guidance and support from my higher self and from your guides. Um, anyone who's asking the question, I just say, Hey, help me with any of the questions that anyone comes to this show with, because I want to provide from the highest level that I can insights to help us all overcome because everyone has similar questions. I mean, some shows I go, wow, all those questions were like, like there was such a thread or a theme through each one of them. So yes. And I, I so love participating in everyone's lives and, and I learned so much myself from everyone's questions too. So thank you for asking them. And if you're on here on a replay or you're on here live and you have a question, please type it in the chat. All right. Next question. Any suggestions for nurturing friendships with people who are interested in the same but who have a difficult time committing or prioritizing it. Well, you know what? I, the words that come to me is I would call bullshit on this, right? I would just really look into this. We are, we are all busy in our own ways. Um, and I would not from a judgment place, not from judgment, from a heart centered place. Do you feel that this person is really committed to your relationship or are they just using time as an excuse? Are you using it as an excuse to not realize that maybe this friendship isn't worth my time or maybe this friendship, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I just mean like, is it worth my time in the sense that are they vibrating at a similar level? Do we have commonality and why we're spending time together? You know, sometimes it's just to have fun, but sometimes it's also to have deep, deeper discussions. Sometimes it's to, you know, share our deepest, darkest secrets. Um, feel into like, where is that friend on that spectrum? Um, do they not have good time management skills with their entire life? Sometimes that helps to determine, you know, is it personal? Is it, or is it just them? But we know, we know how this goes. I mean, think back, like if, I don't know what your age is, but when you were first dating someone, right, you make time. Why? Because the intrinsic desire is I want to get to know this person. I want to spend time with this person. And so I'm not saying that all of our friends need to be held to that same, that same standard, but I'm saying when the desire is there, we find time we find time. So I don't know. I just kind of get this nudge that maybe there's just a little bit of a misalignment. It doesn't mean you can't be friends with them or whatever, but I would also just mirror. Here's another good thing that's coming. Mirror how they communicate with you. Shine your light, be in truth. But if you're the one always asking, can we get together? Can we get together? Can we get together? And they're not, or they're saying yes. And then they're not committing back off, just back off and just see, are they going to come to me? Because you want that give and take, right? It's all always about giving it and receiving. So just really feel into this one, feel into this about, about everyone. And, you know, I, I know sometimes it's hard to, to, you know, move away from people and especially when we want to spend time with them and they don't want to spend time with us or they're not making the time, but maybe that's just another nudge to just find another new person. And maybe when you find another new person, there's an energetic shift that happens where that person kind of comes around. Cause there's just something always about this ebb and flow of like one person's like really in the other person's not, and you know, it goes back and forth and why it can't align more frequently is, is, you know, always a mystery, but, um, but there is something in that ebb and flow for each one of us to realize and to recognize. Right. And so it's, it's often about not being so attached or needy. I'm not saying you're needy. I'm just saying that that ebb and flow is often about attachment and neediness. And that's when someone goes, Ooh, I don't know. 
right? So uh, just feel into it. You'll you'll get this one. Um, but I do have a feeling that, that this person doesn't have the same desire for the friendship that you might. And I don't mean that in a hurtful way. I think you get what I'm saying. Just feel into it. You moving away could also bring their desire closer. Okay. So next question. How can one alleviate their femininity in such a way that it is an empowering way being for a male companion? This is a very deep question because it's not an easy one, you know, pony response here. This is like, there are so many layers to femininity, but I will say if I have to summarize it to keep it simple, <laughs> It's about receiving and women making broad, general sweeping statements right now, which doesn't mean it's everybody, but women are really acting masculine these days. Why? Because we felt we had to, we had to, to get ahead and, or even just to be seen in corporate, right? To get ahead in corporate for some people. We had to kind of come with more masculine in us. So we thought my challenge is always going to be, is that real? Because the power of the feminine in its true sense is mic dropping. <laughs> I don't even know why I'm saying that, but it is. It's when we show up, not in the sexuality part of it. When we show up in our heart center and in our true feminine and we're able to receive and we're able to give, right? And we're in that incredible flow. And yet we know when to, fla to flex the masculine. It doesn't mean you're like, oh, I'm damsel in distress. You know, no, you're not always that. No, that doesn't mean feminine but there is an element of allowing the masculine to come in and to help us out. Right. But the masculine right now is just as messed up as the feminine. The masculine don't even know how to be men anymore. Like, should I hold the door? Should I not hold the door? <laughs> should I come around to the side of the car or not? You know, it's like some women find that repulsive. Some of oh, what you think I can't get out of the car myself. I can't open the door. It's gotten really kind of crazy. So we have to get beyond the ideas about these things, the storylines, the narratives around what opening a door means. It doesn't mean a power play. It doesn't mean chivalry exactly. It means, ha, huh, nice. The guy's coming to open my door. It's nice. Somebody's offering to pay. Um, being in the receiving is the most important thing about this femininity. Being soft right? We come at life. I mean, I have been there and I'm still there on days. I, I, I've worked so hard on my, on my feminine because coming out of divorce many, many, many years ago, having to live my life alone, working a corporate job, you know, getting in there and wanting to do a good job, wanting to, to be competitive in a good way, um, built a lot of skill sets that weren't really helping me out in the romantic front. Because I was taking care of myself and I didn't need a man. You know, well, there's no man out there that wants to be with a woman <laughs> that doesn't need a man. Like, why? You know, that's like, we got to get back to that balance. We got to get back to that beautiful way of just being in harmony with one another. Where we're not using power and influence and sexuality and, you know, sensuality. Yeah. I would say sensuality because sensuality comes from the heart. Sensuality comes from how we move our bodies. It comes from how we flow. It comes from how we respond. It comes comes with how we we approach someone, right? Like all of those things. Be aware. Okay, so the question: How can one elevate? How can one elevate femininity in such a way that it is an empowering way um, for a male companion? Be soft. Be in your heart. Be vulnerable, appropriately vulnerable. Ask about them. Pump them up. Yeah. Pump them up, you know, and not, not full of shit. Pump them up. Like, Hey, you recognize something about them, whatever it is. Hey, I really like that about you. Oh, wow. You just shared that story and you're so in your heart. Oh, wow. That's really great. 
right? That kind of stuff, the genuine kind of stuff, the cheerleader kind of stuff, but not from a, you know, pom poms and like rah, rah, no, from a, like, Hey, I see you. I see you and your masculine over there. I see you doing your thing. Hey, thanks. I like it. I like that you put your hand on my back. I like it. Tell them they need it just as much as we do. We all just want that, that feeling of knowingness that we're being seen and that someone cares for us, right? And that we're caring for them. Let's not get so overly complicated about this, but we do have to just peel back the layers, whether you're a male or a female listening to this. Figure out how to, if you're a man, figure out how to get more in your feminine, which means, ooh, ooh geez, you got to talk about how you feel, um, which isn't always just the feminine, but it is about being in your heart. It is about receiving. So as a man, when is it appropriate for you to receive? Maybe you giving, giving, giving is stopping you from being in a, in a relationship with someone because you really need to be receiving and not see that as a threat to your power. So, you know, it's always about perspective, isn't it? It's always about just opening and expanding our lens of perception. And so much more comes when we do. All right, let's go to the next question. I'm always happy to hear in the comments. Uh, let me know. I know, especially in the live here, there's uh, thoughts that come through and I just love to hear, even if you disagree with me or you just want to add something, I'm, I'm always happy to hear. Okay. How can, oops, hold on. Um, how can I recognize toxicity in a relationship sooner? Or maybe how can I build better boundaries in a toxic relationship? First of all, get the hell out of the toxic relationship, right? Um, if you know that there's toxicity, then get out. Maybe we need to define toxicity. Um, I think everybody, yeah, there's different layers and levels here with this word too, right? Um, it's always a lesson for you. But if someone feels toxic, meaning that it's not helping you in like your mind narrative and what's going on in your head, then, or they're physically harming you or, you know, they're emotionally shaming you or blaming you or whatever and not doing their own work, then yeah, they're toxic. Then, then, then get them out of your life. But if they're kind of, I feel like it kind of ties into an earlier question. If you're learning and they're learning, then you're doing the right thing, right? And their toxicity in the true sense of all this and oneness is your toxicity. So whatever they're doing to you is some aspect of yourself. I know that's hard to accept, but it's some aspect of yourself that you are asking them to reflect to you for your own healing that only you can do, not them. So I think it's really staying out of any type of blame game about someone else and their toxicity. But I do think it's important to recognize toxicity in relationships. It's where you feel like there's not an, an, a give and take, you know, where you feel like someone's not respecting you for who you are. That's toxic. And move away. It's really that simple. I know sometimes it doesn't feel that simple, but um, I don't think you need to have boundaries in a toxic relationship. I, need, I think you need to get out. All right, next question. Uh, my partner seems to have narcissistic tendencies and refuses to heal their trauma. What should I do? Love them and leave them. It's that simple. Um, it's their journey. Like we have to let people live their journey. I am so guilty of this myself. Like, oh my goodness, I want to help you everybody, right? I, oh, I've done the work and I want to show you and I want to hold your hand. But listen, we've got to let people do their own journeys. It's their free will. You, we can't pull anyone through. Certainly speaking to myself here. Um, we can shine the light, show the way, guide people through right? We can guide by being a living example of what it's like to be in a higher vibration and to let our light shine through, to not tolerate these crazy things that are happening. But again, look, if you're attracting narcissists, there is something within you, you want to dig into. 
for real. I know I get kind of tired of people blaming narcissists, um, but the narcissist empathic empath thing is a thing right now. Like seriously, it's a thing. Like narcissists are seeking out empaths and for whatever reasons, empaths are allowing narcissists to suck on their light. Right. And it's just like this, this, yeah, it's, it's not a good combination, but there are such juicy, juicy lessons and nuggets in there. So get in there, figure it out. Why am I bringing in narcissists and what is it about myself? I need to blow up. What are those shadow aspects about myself? What is that darkness within everything is within me and everything outside is an external reflection. I'm not just saying this, there's like books written on this, the holographic universe, you know, uh, quantum physicists are writing about this, right? It's, it's not, uh, it's not something I'm just making up here. So it is our life that we are creating and we just need to take accountability for it. So, um, yeah, those narcissists, we got to love them too, but we don't have to stay with them. We got to love them and leave them. Okay. Next question. When do we know if we're just empathic people, pleasers without boundaries and are focused on wanting to heal the other person instead of moving on? I think this is kind of similar actually to what we just talked about, but um, let's, let's dive into it just a little bit here coming down to the end of the show. Um, feel into, you know, your empathic abilities. How much are you taking on of someone else's pain, someone else's story, someone else's wounds? Recognize where are my wounds and how are we connecting on the wounds, right? And as an empath, as someone who really feels for others with the idea of wanting to heal another, I think, again, it comes back down to where's my stake in the ground? Where am I? And in some cases, if your stake is really in there and you're really connected, you're really in the vertical column of light, you may not have to leave them. You may not have to move on. You may just hold the vertical column of light for your own practice, for your own beingness. To, to really just feel into, am I capable of this? I mean, of course you're capable of it, but like, am I able to show myself that, that this, I can hold this state of higher vibration of a vertical column and still have this person in my life? Or is it sucking me? Is it really pulling on me to a place where I can't maintain myself? That's a really important question because there's going to be light suckers and people who are like wounded left and right, it's only going to get more. And as your light shines brighter, you're going to attract more and more and more of these types of people because they see your light and they want what you have. I mean, I wrote in the introduction of my book that love is the new currency. How rich are you? And I a hundred percent believe that if you've got love and light deep within you, people want that. That's what people are going to want. They're going to want that more than money because they're going to recognize that that is the internal source of everything in our life. It's our, it's, it's everything. It's our happiness. It's everything that brings us the bliss within ourselves. It's not outside of ourselves. Kind of a good note to leave on. I so appreciate you. I so appreciate you coming to the channel, asking the questions. Please don't forget to subscribe, to like this video, to share it with friends to tell the world, and to most importantly, keep your light shining brightly. Don't let anyone dampen it. And I'll see you next week, 11-11 on Sunday.